Hello, and welcome to the Paul Cardall Podcast. Did you know the best way to support your favorite musician is to bypass social media and go to their website and subscribe to their mailing list? Going directly to the artist's website ensures you and the artist will have no third party controlling your relationship. It's a direct contact. Please show your support, particularly for our host. Go to Paul's website and subscribe, followed by other artists you enjoy. Visit www.paulcardall.com. Hey, Paul. Hey, Luke. How are you? Good and you, buddy. Yeah, man. Let's just get started. I, uh, I'm a fan. I love your music, and obviously I was drawn to it from Silicon Boone. Uh, right. Obviously, that's his alias. We know him as who he yeah. is. Right. <laughs> Which I think is great because he's got this whole life completely set right. from music, and yet the music is completely part of him. You know, totally. I guess it's like yeah. No, I, I definitely see why he does it, um, and it's cool, definitely. And you guys have been friends for quite some time. Did you uh, discover each other with through the music, or how did your yeah? You know, we. Um, we met in Kentucky where I lived for a while and, and that's the first sort of place I got to in America coming up from South Africa. And he was actually um, in Peru at the time and I was buddies with his um, now wife. Oh. And, um, and I met him um, through her and then, and we were both sort of dabbling in songwriting at the time. And then as, and then we sort of, we started sort of taking it seriously um, actually as our friendship group. Um, I would say he's for sure the most like instrumental um, songwriting friend I've I've had in my life by far. He's extremely gifted, but yeah, <laughs> he is. He thinks deeply about every detail. Right. Yeah. Totally. But look, man. I mean, in every way, I see so many similarities. And as we talk, we'll uh, get down that rabbit hole because you have music that is a huge influence from growing up in South Africa. And then you have this whole Kentucky right. experience. And now you're living in Hawaii, which is a great yeah. time. Fields invisible to progress. A man works hard for what a man gets. Shaking his palm with a moon quiet. Resting his heart in desire Drink, my child, drink your fill Drink it while, drink until your world is run Your world is run <laughs> Yeah, thanks, yeah. Yeah, we love it here, my wife and kids and I. I've loved every place I've ever lived. Um, you know, I think every place is like that. It's got it's got good and it's got bad. You know, and and I'm I'm a pretty optimistic guy. I think at heart, um, pretty idealistic. So, but yeah, I I love Hawaii and we love Hawaii. We can't really, so we couldn't really imagine a, another place to live right now. It's not too often that you know somebody who's born in South Africa um, ends up in Kentucky, and now you're over in. Uh, Hawaii. So take us back to South Africa and growing up listening to American music. I mean, that must have been thrilling. And what kind of music were you listening to that your father was, you know, the records he would play? So let's take us yeah. back to South Africa. Yeah. So, so um, growing up in South Africa, looking back, it was, I realized I was in such a unique um, period. I, I was born in the 80s. And, um, it ended up being like a super pivotal time. And um, I, I I grew up in sort of apartheid and, and post of apartheid, I would call it. I remember some of my good friends um, would go to school and my, some of my good friends would have to stop at the gates and show the guy his little black book, you know, his identification. When I say my good friends, my, my friends of color, either Asian, um, black, or, you know, we have a, a and we, we sort of have two African races is where we we call it black and colored and, and they're different in south africa and then and then all all asian descent so they'd have to present this id book and i would just sort of walk through the gate and i thought nothing of it i, I was just like oh yeah that's just kind of normal you know i mean i was a young kid so 
I, I grew up with that, and then I had I had maids, and my maids had, and they lived with us, and um, my maids had um, kids, and I would play with the maids' kids, and they sort of weren't allowed in my house um, because they were black, and I I didn't I didn't really think anything of it at the time, so I was growing up with a lot of this kind of stuff, um, and then around like, uh, and then on and then on on Sundays my dad would. Um, clean the house we'd all clean the house together and he'd play music mm. and um it would he, mainly he played the beatles and simon on garfunkel and cat stevens Perfect. and those guys are um and were pretty subversive um you know they they uh i mean they, they have a lot of good old fun kind of songs but they're they're they sing about subversive things um and i remember listening to graceland and mm. thinking like wow this is kind of weird. Like there's, there's a lot of African singers on this. Um, and it, it, it sort of like did something to me where I was like, uh, it, that doesn't sound right. Right. In my sort of my post apartheid white brain, but it sounds really good. Um, and so, so that was, I would say like, that was the start of me, like sort of breaking out of, um, what I was in as a kid and growing up as well as becoming really good friends with a couple of um, black boys. Um, so I would say that m music and that sort of, of helped um, me sort of turn on the light or help turn on the lights. And then of course, Nelson Mandela, yeah. um, when he, he came, he, he got free and then he became president in 1994. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, my dad, my dad, Thankfully, now I look back, he, he, I, I think he had really good taste in music because I love those guys. Um, and those guys were singing about things um, that sort of meant something. Um, and I think that's, that's how I got started in um, listening to music. And then later, much later when I started writing music, I think I started emulating those, or trying to emulate those guys because that was the only kind of music that made sense to me that uh, that you had something to say and something important to say um so yeah so so after that i i all this while i grew up um playing tennis um that was kind of my main stick and the message in south africa was always get out um you got to you got to move especially to um i i think it was still sort of the 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 white propaganda get out get out get out you know as as the country became free and so i got a tennis scholarship to a little school in kentucky called campbellsville right in the middle of kentucky okay. and um in my mind i thought kentucky and new york city were the same thing like i, I mean i was just like that's one and the same right yeah i mean i had no idea what to make other than yeah yeah it's the same <laughs> <laughs> and and so um so yeah, so I, I got to Kentucky and I was like, whoa, what is this place? Like it felt, it, it kind of felt more stuck in time than where I grew up in, a, in the city of East London, um, in South Africa. And um, I immediately fell in love with the warmth of the people um, and, you know, and later to find out all the Southern, um, uh, you, you know, the Southern stereotypes um, were pretty true as far as the warmth and the kindness and i was really welcomed into this community so so that that's how i got to america from south africa uh, i think a lot of us grow up and are are taught basically um through the eyes of those that have been there for yeah. a couple generations and so we're thinking this is all and which is you know paul simon the boy in the bubble right and so we're in that bubble and until you travel until you uh witness how other people are living their lives it's hard to i guess have the scales fall down from your eyes to oh. understand that everybody i think everybody is uh has has the blinders on until you get out and try to understand other people because you know the way you're you're talking about uh south africa you know to some people would be like oh my gosh he said color he said black you know it's like what can you say as um um white people and yet these are our brothers and our sisters and um 
you know, uh, one of the things on your bio is that you, you got into submersive literature, which is basically defending uh, people that are outcasts. And yeah, that stemmed out there in South Africa. Yeah, so I, I think that, you know, what, what happened really, I was thinking about it, what happened first is I sort of, uh, when I was 16, 17, I started getting like my, my eyes, the, the scales were starting to fall off, right? And um, I started noticing um, the, just the poverty around me. And I started noticing how, how rich I was. So I, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it in any third world country. The difference between the third world and the first world is the middle class. And you've really only got rich or poor. There's nothing in the middle. And, um, and, that, and I didn't realize that. Like, I mean, I didn't realize that I was the uber wealthy until the scale started coming off. And, and I, I, started, um, I started working a little bit with street kids when I was 16, 17, 18. And that helped a lot. Um, and so what I was, was going to say with the literature thing is I started having these experiences first where I was like, wait a minute, these guys are, there's no one to defend them. They they grow up in in tin shanty towns. They don't have they don't have enough money for proper schooling. Um, in South Africa, you kind of have to pay for good schooling, and then they get told by their parents to go beg at the traffic lights um, for paraffin and bread because the parents are taking care of the house. And then and and then that's it. And so, I, I a part of me was like, wow, that they like their lot is so different from mine and it will remain like this if people like me don't help. And so then when I, when I got to um, Kentucky and I saw America, I was like, wow, this is like a totally different place um, than South Africa. And now don't get me wrong. America's definitely got its problems with, with poverty, um, but it's still light years ahead of South Africa. Um, But when I was in college, I actually, I read a book um, by Alan Payton, uh, a great South African author, and I, I didn't read it in South Africa. I read it in Kentucky called Cry the Beloved Country. That was one of my first um, books that I read that basically, have you, have you heard about that book or read it? I have not read the book, but I've yeah. heard it. People- yeah, so it basically, it, it, it basically um, exposes i mean it, it talks about a lot but it, it basically exposes some of this or, or talks about you know uh, a lot of this what i'm what i've been talking about the injustice the um the different systems set up and then it, and then so i read that on my own and then i i got a degree in literature and, and um i also hadn't read um huckleberry finn i never read that book before and then i read that when i was in college and it was sort of like a they were sort of like companions in a way, um, those books. And, and so those are the two books that were, were kind of like explained a little bit of my experience in South Africa, right? Except that I, was, um, I wasn't the one who was captive, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, those are the two books that I would say really started opening up my eyes. Um, and that again, like I, I got naturally drawn to like this, this subversive way of telling stories like, like Paul Simon. Um, you know, it, it, being able to include um, Zulu singers on his album when, like, you know, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure he had to go through some, like, pretty tough means to get those guys in South Africa. They recorded in South Africa. I'm sure the, the government threw a, a, up a storm about it, and it was probably pretty tough for him. But, you know, that was, like, his way of, like, subverting the the current, like, injustice, Right. Um, and then these two books as well, like telling a story, trying to open, open the eyes, but drawn to both modes, both styles. The whole time that was going down with Mandela and, you know, the apartheid and the country changing, you have these songwriters that help pop culture understand what's really going on. And Paul Simon was so instrumental in right. exposing it and and in a way he made it so that we all fell in love trying to tell us what's going on and obviously prophets like martin luther king like mandela the people that are speaking for the people and what needs to happen in order for yeah. change you know in america um i believe the founding fathers are prophetic in saying you know we need to have freedom we need to be able to um 
have liberty for everybody. Everybody should have equal opportunity. We should be able to worship according to our conscience. And so, yeah, that's fascinating that you would then shift to Kentucky, which is a a big Christian uh, community, but people are actually, people are actually trying to be, to be good people and to help each other. Um, Was that, so that was your experience there in Kentucky? You know, like I said, like, it's 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 kind of a tricky thing because um a lot of people and and i i i i agree with the sentiment a lot of people still believe there's a lot of racism in america and i agree with 100 percent. there is right um hopefully one day they won't be um but south africa the racism is just like a million times worse like it really is you know um even now you know, I well at least in the older generation, um, the 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 younger younger than me even is, I would say I was like the that sort of my generation was the turning point, but yeah, Kentucky was light years ahead of South Africa, but at the same time, you can see you can see the sort of the remnants of of what you're talking about the history, right? Yeah. Um, and so like. You know, I remember one of one of the strange things that happened. It's the same thing in South Africa. It's getting better though, and and I think this might also just be a rural thing versus city thing. But in Kentucky, there's still a lot of white only churches, black only churches, right? right? And I was sort of sad about that. You know, I remember going to a black only church for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and and it, yeah, so there's still like a lot of that stuff, which isn't intentional, but it's just, you know, it's just from the it's just from history and the way things have played out. Um, but yeah, Kentucky, as far as racism goes, where I was in Campbellsville was light years ahead of South Africa. Yeah. I think it will. It's generational. We are, That's product, what we are products of heritage and, and, you know, when you go back into American history, the Puritans were really the ones that came here and they had a belief that they had this crazy, bizarre belief that if you were righteous and had accepted Jesus, you were light skinned. And uh, those that were descendants of Cain in their belief were had dark skin. And so there was this horrible idea passed down clear back from the the 1600s that trickled down into the United States. And thank God we, we made it through so much of that horrific stuff but i want to touch on uh the song you did with joe pennell um the light is coming because in that first one of those lyrics you have is we're all the same just waiting for the morning you were like a river bird floating free below the tree and then the water stirred now yesterday's a wind Blowing wild, bleeding sky, but you can start again. We're all the same, just waiting for the morning. People losing faith and wondering why we're born. This groaning night that beats with heartless drums. Just close your eyes, cause all the light is coming. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Well, um, yeah. So, you know, that was one of those songs. I'm sure you've had many of them um, where it, it just, it totally just came to me. Um, I feel like I've, I've had to work for a lot of my songs, but that one just, I think it came in a night. Um, Joe sent me a, a little riff that he had and he was like, Hey, you know, this is what I'm working on. And I, I heard the riff and immediately I, I heard it. And um, I mean, it just, it just came. And um, yeah, basically the idea, like I said, I'm, I, I feel like at heart, I'm, I'm pretty um, optimistic and idealistic, but the older I get, the, the more I see that life's pretty brutal. Um, and so I, you know, some of the, that optimism and idealism um, is confronted with the, you know, the sort of the tragedy of life and, and the goodness and joy of it, of course. But that, that's what that song is about. You know, it's, it's, it's about understanding like hey we're gonna go through some pretty difficult things um 
but really the the prize and the joy and the goodness is ironically can be in those things mm -hmm. you know those the, the the difficulties it's not like those difficulties uh are one hundred percent going to give us something good or are the are the the um the end the the means to the end but it can be if we have eyes to see and then the other thing is obviously just sort of hanging on you know not giving up um where the, you know that that idea of the light is coming and we're all the same um just waiting for the morning love it people losing faith and wondering why we're born is there a specific like major challenge that you had in your life that uh gave you this education sort of a growing period or is all that stem out of south africa or is there a specific thing you i mean we all go through multiple things but is there a specific thing yeah that, that really tested you yeah i think there were besides the south african stuff I, I think there's been two you know i would say the south african stuff is a little more on the macro level the micro level a little more personal um when my second daughter um was born we almost lost her um she, uh, about three weeks she long story but she basically got a staph infection we had to get medevac out of here um and we were close to losing her thankfully we didn't um that was that was one of that that was pretty hectic um and then a big test and then i would say that the next big one was um like i said i i teach tennis for uh full-time for a living and um much of my identity identity um for better or worse has been built around tennis um and about four years ago i seriously injured my left wrist and i'm left-handed hmm. um, and so obviously all the worst sort of things come to your brain you know i'm like oh no i just bought this house in hawaii i'm about to lose my job you know it's all coming to an end um so yeah i would say that those two events were, were were probably the the biggest challenges of my life so far um and yeah i in in light of in light of what a lot of people go through those don't seem very big but you know they, they were to me um yeah but I, I think that that song you know it it's i i think more than that i, I wasn't really thinking specifically anything about myself i was more just sort of I think over the last two years, I've I've um, I've been reconciling um, this I you know like I said this idea of, of being optimistic um, and idealistic and believing you know in the good in all things and believing for the good, but then also you know trying to um, be honest about life, right? Trying to hold those two things, and really that's what that song is about. It's it's about trying to trying to hold the real hard things that happen, but the goodness that is there. And we will be right back. Not only is Paul a podcast host, but has gifted the world with award-winning music that's brought comfort to millions of listeners in more than 160 nations. His latest album, Return Home, is an introspective listening experience. Each song, carefully crafted, takes listeners on a cinematic journey to the lands of his ancestors. Whether you just need to relax, study, meditate, pray, or for some other healthy reason, Paul's music helps create an atmosphere of peace wherever you are. Add Paul Cardall's album Return Home to your favorite platform, whether it's iTunes, Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, Pandora, or some other. For the sheet music and more information, visit www.paulcardall.com. You mention as you get older, you start to recognize how brutal the world is. And a lot of us become cynics, yeah. sar sarcastic. How has, because I know for me, it's been amazing, but how has having children brought back a sense of uh, innocence and understanding because you know the world's brutal right but there's an innocence that uh, in their eyes how has that affected you and possibly your songwriting yeah that's a really great question i love it um yeah yeah it you know the things that children believe are incredible right 
and the things that like the things that sort of disturb their minds are incredible as well in, in terms of how naive they are. But it's amazing how naive they are sometimes. You're like, you're like, man, I wish I could think like that again, you know? Um, so yeah, my wife and I, like, we we actually try to do this. We we try let our kids believe the great wild things, right? And and not not uh quench it. Um so it's you know. I guess we major more on on letting them believe to the point of like, man, that's impossible versus giving them a good dose of of truth, right? Now, when when uh when they don't want to do their homework or when uh you know there's something online that kind of affects it there when we give it to them. We you know, we I always have the story with them that I tell them, um, I just made it up one day and I I, I feel like I should share it with them every day. I say, um, you know, there's a man, he lives in his house and he, he lets his grass grow and he, and he, he knows he has to uh, cut it, but he's like, ah, not today. And then tomorrow it becomes harder. And then the next day it becomes harder. And the next day it becomes harder instead of just cutting it on that first day. And so I often use that story to them saying like, Hey, you know what? You got to take care of the things, but then you can believe and hope for everything you want. Right. Like afterwards. Um, but yeah, as far as, as far as, um, in my songwriting, I, I um I don't know if I I don't know if um having kids or my relationship with my girls has affected my songwriting as much. Um it it's funny I was I was encouraged the other day by someone um to to write a silly song with my girls or to to write a song about my girls. And I sort of took that as a challenge and I realized I was like man I haven't really done that, you know, and I haven't really I haven't even really written a song about my girls and I'd like to. So so maybe that's sort of the next thing for me. I found it difficult to write for um, family for yeah, I have two girls and uh, I've written songs for them, but it was some of the most difficult songs because this is something that they're going to have for forever. And I'm like, it's got to be good. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it can't be one of my worst. It has to be one of my right. worst. Uh, totally. It's going to get passed on to their kids, you know, because music, yeah. music is eternal. We, we go back into the ground and uh yeah it, it just it lasts forever um and so i don't know do you ever think about that like just how music will continue beyond the grave yeah oh yeah that's totally i mean that's one of the you know that's one of the things that i love about uh making music or and writing is that um it's it's like leaving a, a legacy right or leaving something even for my kids i i do often think about that you know that um that I'm, I'm leaving something for my kids, 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 right? Generations. And that's pretty incredible. Yeah, it's heavy stuff, but it's amazing. It about Now, um, we'll talk about some more music, but you do a lot of writing. You do. Uh, yeah. You love that. And where did that come from? I mean, you're left-handed, which means, and I'm left-handed, which means we're the only ones in our right mind. Uh, and right mind <laughs> are a lot more artistic. And I like that expressive but yeah you've written uh quite a few things billy and the priest the bridge across i can't even say right inca ravine the open road you have yeah, such a website that look amazing uh for people to check out but where did that all stem from when i was in kentucky i i thankfully got it um connected to a super creative community um and very intentional community um you know, like we, we all sort of encouraged each other to pursue these things. So a lot of my good friends, like our mutual buddy, um, Silicon, um, were trying to pursue these things. And I enjoyed writing and songwriting. And I feel like I, I, I enjoy the, the songwriting I enjoy is similar to my writing. It's, it's story like, um, and yeah. And I feel like they help each other. So, but I, I'd always dabbled in it a little bit, sort of just as a hobby, you know, if I didn't have anything to do, I just kind of, pick up the guitar or, or write something. When I hurt my wrist, um, yeah, when I hurt my wrist, it was before COVID, probably about five years ago. I, um, it, it did something to me. Like I, I was like, whoa, I'm, I'm, I have, to, I'm, I'm not, I'm not Luke the tennis player anymore kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, and so I had to, I, I had to like sort of discover who I, I was, who I am. Um, so I started, um, 
I started the, my writing journey a little more seriously, more than a hobby, was when I hurt my wrist, probably about, it was about five years ago. And I read an article saying that if you write 250 words a day, um, you can write a novel in a year. Hmm. And I was like, wow, that's not a lot, 250 words a day. It, it, it's not a lot. Um, so, th so there was that idea. And the second, don't edit. You know, one of the, one of, uh, I think, I think a big problem that you probably have as well, Paul, I think all artists have is, is uh, self-critique and editing. And losing that little voice is amazing when you can. Now, obviously, it, it's, it's probably the hardest thing, one of the hardest things we deal with. But I started losing that voice with writing. I was just like, I don't care. I'm just going to write 250 words. It's just going to be like going to the gym. And so I started that. Um, and I, I wrote my first novel, um, which is going to be published next year. But um, I, haven't, uh, I haven't stopped for the last five years. So I've, I've pretty much been writing 250 words a day, every day. Um, and yeah, I love it. Um, it's, it's like therapy. It's, uh, it's my creative, it's one of my creative, uh, you know, sources or, or um, uh, outlets, um, as well as songwriting. I've been told and I've seen this is that therapists tell people that if you want to process any trauma or anything in your life is to journal. And, yeah. and I've discovered that as I journal and I've kept a meticulous journal because that's my heritage, preserve your history, you know, uh, so you can pass it down. And when you journal, you're, you're putting down on paper what you're feeling. Um, and it, it does, it literally helps you, bullet point or process and then you're able to see it from as you read it back see it from another angle and then you're able to right. get through that and do you do you find that as well with writing oh yeah totally um i don't know i don't know who said it but one of my favorite quotes i think that sums that up is um it, it was something like um if life was if life was fair there wouldn't be as much art right and that's exactly it. Like the, the, the unfairness of life, um, I feel like to deal with it is, is to, to get it out, to be, to be creative. So, so sort of, even if my story is about someone, you know, a character who's, uh, you know, uh, I don't know about to lose his family. And, and I know nothing about that because, you know, I haven't experienced that. There's something, there's some kind of trauma of mine that's in that story. Right. It's it's a release of something that's in me. So yeah, one hundred percent. I have a friend who's a New York Times bestseller, and if I want to know what's going on in his life, he, I read his fiction book. He yeah, changes yeah. names and things with that, but it's an experience he's had in his life, or an experience he's observing that's happening to other people. Because this is where we draw yeah. our inspiration. We see things unfolding, and uh, yeah, I'm like. Hey, I, I, I didn't realize that was going on in your life. He said, how'd you know? I said, I read it in your book. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, okay. yeah, you can always get into the heart of what somebody is dealing with or what they're passionate about, you know, right. then you've got, you know, writers like Stephen King and you're like, do I really want that guy to come over for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, totally. Like if you could have any author over to dinner, who would it be? Oh, uh, one hundred percent uh, Steinbeck. Steinbeck. Yeah, that's yeah. What yeah a he's a pretty heavy guy, but but wow, I I I feel like I I feel like uh, Steinbeck. He 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 creates something so beautiful out of something so ordinary and just every day. And yeah. to me, that's incredible. That's that's like the the goal of art in my mind. Yeah, he's he's good, you know. I uh, what about um if you could have any any artist like musician over to the house a, a singer? I think I think for sure current or or um or or still alive or dead. Any, anyone. I would say anybody. I would say well, let's give alive and dead. Okay. Man, that's a tough one. I I I probably got like I've got like three, I, 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 for sure, Dylan and Springsteen tie. Okay. I, 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 one day it's Dylan, one day it's Springsteen. Um, and then, uh, and then I, and then I think, 
I would have to say Johnny Clegg um, dead. Um, the, the great South African Paul Simon. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know Johnny Clegg. Oh, yeah. He, you'll love his stuff. Cool. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I'm going to have to check it out. So he, he, he's really the, the reason why Paul Simon um, did Graceland. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, he, Johnny Clegg was doing that type of thing um, long before Paul Simon. And Paul Simon heard one of his albums um, and was like, hey, I'm going to do Graceland in South Africa. Did that have so yeah? So did that have a lot of influence on this other project you did, which I think this is fascinating. The you did my African dream, this song, and you've got all these singers in it. Yeah. And then is Madaba kind of the same? Um is that all part of South Africa? Yeah. So exactly right. So like I I I wanted to um, I wanted to put out a little EP, um, three songs for South Africa about South Africa, and, and it was sort of based on the, my two heroes, Johnny Clegg and Paul Simon, and those albums. And basically, the idea is that those guys used a type of singing called Istatimaya, which is a it's basically like Zulu a cappella. Okay. And um, and, and it's it's prominent in Johnny Clegg and on Graceland. Um, and I was and I knew I wanted to do that. So I was actually fortunate enough to make contact with Johnny Clegg's lead guitarist in South Africa, Andy Innes. No and, and he helped me um, source a lot of the Zulu singers. Um, and those guys wrote the parts. And yeah, we, so we did it together um, with a, a buddy of mine, John Kloss in Nashville. Did you curl your legs? They went from brown to red. Like some cursed amoeba, a dirty floor your bed. Did they call you Nelson with their tongues of poison? The black man, deceiver, the prophet rejoicing. Hey, hey, the deeper, the darkness had no place to keep you. Hey, hey, believer, the promise and the pain of breakthrough, just a dream. And yeah, that, so the idea was, the idea was sort of trying to emulate uh, Paul Simon's Graceland in those three songs. It's so good, you know, an ambitious project and i'm I'm just looking i just looked up madaba and it's the uh clan name for nelson mandela uh that's right described as father of the nation that's i love that that you integrated that that title into that song it says hey madaba darkness had no place to keep you hey hey believer the promise and the pain of breakthrough just a dreamer I, very poetic your lyrics uh -huh. In fact, I, I had a, one of the biggest producers here in town in Nashville who's written a lot of songs, has Grammys, has uh, Dove Awards, which is the Christian Awards, helping a lot of people. And uh, he put over on the new, the new Threads app, uh, poignant lyrics, question mark. And I, I put uh, from My African Dream, I put fields invisible to progress, a man works hard for what a man gets, shaking his palm with a moon choir, resting his head in desire. And he threw back the emoji with the just, uh. <laughs> he couldn't believe it because, you know, working on country music, which I'm not bashing country music, but you have to get into that mindset of talking very simple. Yeah. And this is deep. This is if anyone who reads literature, anyone who has a more sophisticated ear is going to connect more with your music. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So that song, my African dream, I, um, it's about Lesotho, which is, um, it, it's that the highest landlocked country, um, in the world. So it's completely surrounded by South Africa. Um, and I rem I remember visiting the border as a kid and I, and I, I was looking up the mountain pass and I was totally sort of enamored with this place. It, it felt like super mystical, like this, this, they call it the mountain kingdom. And, uh, 
we didn't go up because it was it, it was um, there was too much snow, um, and I I've always sort of like been really fascinated with Lesotho because it the I've never been I've just been to that pass because it's so beautiful and the pictures I've seen and it's high, but it's the AIDS capital of the world and it's 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 like a it's a tragic beautiful place, yeah. um, which sort of. It, it almost feels like a, a picture. It's always sort of felt like a picture of life in a way. And so I wrote this song um, about Lesotho and and almost like a like you said, a, a poets and prophets. I, I almost wrote it prophetically for how I think God sees Lesotho, and that is this beautiful, incredible place. Yet it's it's full of tragedy. Um, I at the time I was reading a book. Um, about uh, by the author Will McGrath, he visited Lesotho on a on a um, on like sort of like an AIDS mission. Um, him and his wife, and um, they they lived there for two years. And and basically, he recounts um, his work there, and, and it's just like death after death after death of like young children. Hmm. Um, it, it's super sad, hmm. but again, like I I I think that the 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 fates and the destiny of Lesotho. Uh, is so much more than that. And so that's what that song's about. Why do you think some of the most beautiful places in the world have the most tragedy? Yeah, right? I know. It's wild. I yeah, mean, I, it's, that's a great question. Have you ever thought about that? I have. I, I actually already have. A lot of these third world places, like they're, they're amazing. They're just so beautiful. The people, the, the land. Um, and then sometimes a lot of like the the most sterile places are like incredibly well functioning, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um yeah, I, I don't know. It 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 it's it's really interesting. Um yeah, it's not true for every place, but yeah, it, it's an interesting thought. My, I don't know. My mother in law um is from Slovenia, which is former Yugoslavia, and surrounding it you've got Austria, you've got Hungary, and you've got Croatia to the south, and then you've got Italy right there. And, you know, if I don't know if you've ever played the game Risk, but this no. game is about invading countries and you use, you roll the dice and you get so many armies and you can go and, and nobody ever wants that part of the, the board, the map, because it's right there in the middle. So everybody's always crossing it in order to invade each other. And that's the reality. It's the most beautiful place on earth. It's like the last place where you'd see villages where Rapunzel is actually moving around. But yeah, it's wow. just, it's been tragic. And that's the only way I've been able to put any sense into how that beautiful part of the world is because it just happens to be in the wrong place for yeah. evil people right. to go in. Now, is this how landlocked is this country because i see that it's right in the middle of south africa but can people leave can people get in yeah yeah you can move in and out and and you you know there are a lot of south africans that are living there and a lot of um Sutu people working in south africa so there isn't any kind of border restrictions um yeah it, it's 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 bizarre like it, um i i don't exactly know I, you'd think that it would be you know, and I don't know the history of Lesotho well enough, but um, obviously, probably one of the, I'm sure one of the reasons why it um, maintained its independence is because of its um, uh, advantage in in war. You know, being being up so high um, in battle. But uh, yeah, it, 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 the the thing that's so bizarre is that it's the AIDS capital of the world. Now, there's a lot of AIDS in South Africa, but especially in Lesotho, it's it's highly concentrated. Um, so yeah, I, I just I don't know. I I I really don't know. I'm I'm interested in it for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. I I I I gravitate. I feel like to the um, I I gravitate to the sort of the weak things, right? Yeah. Um, and Lesotho because I think there's so much more in that. And and Lesotho for me is that it's like the, it's the weakest, uh, one of the weakest countries in the world in terms of in every way. Um, but but I personally don't believe that for it, you know? Yeah, I think the, the, I think the best 
songwriters, musicians in the world are those who are aware of the suffering of people and pull out of that understanding in, in poetic ways so that the average person who is not artistic, and I'd say average in the sense that because they have no artistic ability, they're average in that sense, they're able to, to get inspiration, understanding, I guess, I'm a big believer that when you hear a song, God tells you what you need to know. Right. It's different for everybody. Right. And that's the beauty in telling these stories in the songs that you're bringing understanding. It's like when they did, you know, Live Aid and the Band Aid, right. song, you know, uh, you have the best artists in the world come together for, you know, the cause of AIDS and right. it just sent the entire message to the whole world. Everybody understood the suffering. Right. Totally. I yeah. totally agree with that. Yeah. Well, gosh, you're now in Hawaii. You, I mean, we could go from all that drama to this beautiful <laughs> parody. Yeah. doesn't have, I mean, they've got issues, but they don't have, uh, you know, the sunshine brings joy and happiness. Everyone's got a ukulele. You, <laughs> yeah. You got, you can go get a lot of shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> some mahi mahi all the good stuff yeah. uh, is that why you wrote Pacific when I left my shores one month ago I was sailing across the blue the waters teemed with violent storms to send my boat and true Atlantic bound I was no more Indian a far off thorn the wind and wave Crush my bone, settling a ten year score. Pacific, why do you hold me? Why do you keep me to a war or a crime? Pacific, why don't you? It's funny, I, I'm from Kentucky, I went to Minnesota, I married a Minnesotan. Um, yeah. <laughs> She's really. Um, She's really hot out there in Hawaii. She's <laughs> that's right. <laughs> she loves she loves the Hawaiian weather more than I do. <laughs> Growing up in Minnesota all the time. And she's like, thank God I'm out of Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, she yeah, she just said to me the other day, she's like, oh, I don't think I could live anywhere cold again. I was like, yeah. But we we so I, I moved up to Minnesota and married her, and um, we lived there for two years and. And honestly, Minnesota is probably one of my favorite places in the world, except for the winters. The winters are just brutal, but yeah. the the people are incredible. Um, I really, I really love Minnesota in the Midwest. Um, so all the while, I was working on my green card, um, and we were looking for. We we just wanted to go on an adventure. Um, we just got married, and we're like, hey, let's go somewhere. And we um, we found a little island in Micronesia called Saipan. It's, um, it's about four hours plane ride from Philippines. And so we got uh, teaching jobs there. Um, near, it's near Guam. And so we lived in Saipan for two years, tiny mm. little one. And um, I taught fourth, third and fourth grade and I taught tennis. And uh, um, we loved it there. It's a beautiful island. Um, but then we got hit by a super typhoon. Mm -hmm. And we had just had our first child. And um, I remember it was like the apocalypse, like the like cars were turned upside down and telephone poles were down. It was just, it was brutal. Uh, my wife would have to stand in the line to get gas and I would have to stand in the line to get water. And that, that was our day for like a month. It would take us like six hours a piece. Um, it, was, it was just brutal. So I was like, man, we got to get out of here. I loved, we both sort of loved the island life um, and had fallen in love with the Pacific. Um, and a buddy of mine was like, check out the big island. And so we did, and we ended up moving. I wrote that song though, Pacific in, in Minnesota, um, way before Saipan was even on, on the map. Um, so I think it was, I, I like to call that song, um, my Freudian slip, um, where I, I was, it, it was in there, but I didn't really know it, you know? And, um, that song came out. I mean, I wrote it and then all of a sudden the, our, our path in the Pacific was set. <laughs> it's kind of like really prophetic in a way. That first line, Pacific, why do you hold me? I, that, 
that line alone, because when I came to Nashville, <clears throat> I'd never been to Nashville, uh, grown up in the Rocky Mountains. I come to Nashville and there's just this gravitational pull. And I love that you actually followed through. Most people never yeah. follow through. You, you basically surrender and you're willing to go on the adventure. And that's, yeah, right. that's rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. Man, yeah. man well i'm glad that you not only do tennis and we hope that your hand is improving but a tennis racket does look like a guitar yeah it does so it makes total sense um, right. you have uh an upcoming album uh, a stone in the mouth of the ocean is this a full-length record or what is this yeah, this is this is gonna be my debut full length. Um, so there'll be nine songs on it, um, and the, the the title track is "A Stone in the Mouth of the Ocean." Before the time walker leads me to the slaughter, the man rolled up, ships me across the border with a bottle of beer, note from the vicar, blood on the holy altar. Before the boneyard prison gives me the decision, the old time religion. Tells me what I'm missing, that ancient tradition Land of the hidden, men of the circumcision Before the steamboat captain drowns me in the base of the war-torn nation Tries negotiation with a proclamation My condemnation, stone in the mouth of the ocean I'm a stone in the mouth of the ocean I'm a stone in the mouth of the ocean it basically speaks to um, our our existence in this gigantic universe um, and trying to find a little significance, um, and and that's really what the songs are about: um, reckoning with our frailty, yet still trying to make something of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Again, I love that these have such weight. Each word, each lyric, a stone. Mm -hmm. You know, I dive. Do you dive? You yeah, I don't scuba, but I, 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 I do a little free diving and snorkeling, but yeah. You're down there, and like you say, a stone in the mouth of the ocean. You see so many different things, but without those individual little things, it doesn't fully bring the beauty. It's what brings everything to life. Everything has its own a uh, little part of it. And I was in Israel and in, um, when you go to a lot of the ruins, like old synagogues, they specifically would talk about the stones. Oh, wow. How vital it was for each stone to give the structure strength. Each one had to specifically oh, that's cool. rest somehow on the chief cornerstone. Um, so everything had its part. And I sat there like, and the analogy oh. uh in 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 biblical scripture is stones or people right and it's just i just love all that oh man i love that yeah yeah it's it's amazing it you know i um i guess one thing i didn't say is i during that time i started writing i um i taught myself to play right-handed so i would just i i um i would i would write my 250 words a day and then i would hit 500 balls on the ball machine um, and so now I'm, I'm doing most of my lessons righty. Um, and then I'll, I'll use my left only when I really have to, <laughs> but it, it, it's good. It's just that it's, um, I, I'm just trying to preserve the use for as long as I can, you know, that's incredible. So you're yeah. Amber, what's the word ambidextrous? I can't ambidextrous. Say. Yeah. But you know, most lefties all have a little bit of ambidextrous in, in them. Yeah. I golf right handed. That's about yeah, it. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So, hey, man, it was so good to talk to you, Luke. Yeah, you too, Paul. I appreciate your time, man. And thanks for having me. This is huge. What's the fear? Why do you hold?